Hey, how's it going? You know, Dragon Ball is one of those series where I feel like it's so popular to the point where if you haven't seen the anime, you at least know one person who's watched the show, read the manga, or even played the games. But when it comes to anime games, most of them are usually placed into the same genre, whether it's your typical arena fighter or even action RPGs, which, don't get me wrong, some of them are actually highly respected in the community. But then again, they don't really hold a candle to what's been developed for Dragon Ball over the years. Now, I'm not saying Dragon Ball has released nothing but bangers, because <laughs> we all know that's a rarity on its own considering it's an anime game. But I feel like because there's been so many releases for this series, there's been a couple of diamonds in the rough. And if I were to categorize them, they would fall under three categories. Amazing, decent, and trash. Now I'm sure you're probably sitting there thinking about what games go where, but for me, there's already three games that fit perfectly in these sections and encapsulates what it's like when playing a new Dragon Ball game. Of course, I'm referring to the Legacy of Goku series for the Game Boy Advance. And in today's review, I'll be going over not only my experience playing these games, but also where I'd place them in my category. So let's first start off with Legacy of Goku. Before we got Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, we were given an action RPG back in 2002 for the Game Boy Advance, developed by Webfoot Technologies, that retold the early stories of Dragon Ball Z from the Saiyan Saga to the end of the Frieza Saga. It was a huge success, selling 1.4 million copies in the United States and gave the fans an opportunity to play as their favorite character. And this is my first time playing Legacy of Goku, so for me, my thought process was, if this game was able to sell so many copies and get two games afterwards, it's gotta be goaded. Or maybe not. To first start things off, we gotta discuss the gameplay and how it started the series. And honestly, it wasn't that great. Like, at all. Control wise, you were given some pretty simple mechanics. The ability to explore different areas, fight enemies, use key attacks, and even fly. Which all sounds good on paper, but the execution simply wasn't there. I'm glad we were able to explore since I'm someone who personally likes to see the world that the developers have created. Just not when you're being held back by its movements. When you explore different areas, it feels like a slog of a mission to get from point A to point B due to the fact that not only are you forced to walk the whole way through with no sprint input, you can't walk diagonally either and are limited to only 4 directions. It also didn't help the fact that some of the map designs were a little confusing and I would constantly run into walls because I thought I could walk a certain path. But no. Smack smack smack. However, with the ability to fly, you gain a little bit more speed for a short period of time, and in order to reach hard, you can find orbs randomly placed throughout the maps. Flying helped with getting to certain areas that you weren't able to reach, and of course, was something I utilized pretty frequently. Besides the fact that you would still run into invisible walls while flying, it was still an okay mechanic that helped me maneuver through the maps and run away from enemies. So here's the combat. It was bad. When you think about the Dragon Ball series, I bet a lot of you think about the fights and how hyped it was to see your favorite characters whoop some ass. Especially with the games that we've received over the years, you can see the developers understood the importance of making the fighting mechanics fun and playable. For some. With this, it almost felt like I was playing a Souls game the way I interacted with the enemies. There was a very clear balancing issue when it came to the legacy of Goku 1 and with every person I came across, it wasn't a surprise that I would try to run the opposite direction just to survive. Every time I tried to hit someone, I would occasionally miss the first swing and get damaged with attacks much stronger than my own and completely kill me. Like what do you mean I have to be afraid of wolves just roaming the wild? Why were they so strong? Yes, you can grind levels to get your character to become a little stronger, but honestly it didn't make much of a difference. Sometimes I was able to one shot them and other times they ended up running circles around me and chip away at my health. Not to mention, some of the creatures had a crazy amount of health to the point where I would ask myself, is this fight even worth it? Thankfully enough, I could use the key abilities as well as certain moves that were later taught during the game. Simple key blasts really helped alleviate any stress I had whenever an enemy was from afar, as well as the solar flare which stunned enemies temporarily. But the mightiest game mechanic that this game had to offer was the save button. Because you were able to save right on the spot no matter where you were at, I was able to sacrifice myself without worrying about losing my progress from when I had previously saved the game. Don't think of this as a good thing though because you're left with no choice but to use this method due to how unfair the enemies were. As for the story of the game, Legacy of Goku retells the events that happened during the Saiyan and Frieza saga through the lens of Goku himself. I had hoped that even though I had issues with the combat system, the story couldn't be much worse. All they had to do was take the information from the source material, you know, the manga, and throw it into this game. Saiyan saga? Banger. Frieza Saga? Banger? It's that easy. Six year old son? Learned the Kamehameha from Kami? Isn't that Gohan's Namek fit? Okay, so there was some inaccuracies in this game. 
At this point, meh. My main issue was the fact that even though there was some optional side quests that could be found during your exploration, the request that you were required to complete in order to advance to the next section of the story. It didn't help the fact that some of these quests gave very little information on how to advance to the next stage, which left the player with nothing but confusion, forcing them to countlessly walk around, seeing if the next thing they do will help continue the story. Hey look, I know my son was just kidnapped, but I gotta help save this cat before I can advance to the next area. It was also hard to look at at certain times whenever there was a speech bubble for characters because their designs just didn't match the sprites that were right in front of me. Ugh. It looks like a ghoul. Especially the maze in the Namekian Temple. You can't expect to beat the maze without having to watch a YouTube video because of the amount of hidden paths there were. But as you advance through the story, you eventually get to fight the bosses and yes, they were difficult, but everyone was difficult. There wasn't an area I've been in where I wasn't forced to see Goku's death screen. Which, might I add, that image is from the Cell Saga. <sighs> the final fight with Frieza was very anticlimactic and honestly, this whole story felt anticlimactic. Once I beat the game, I couldn't take a victory lap because throughout my entire gameplay, it just felt like a chore that had to be done, even though I wanted to skip out on it. All in all, I think this was a pretty poor introduction to the series with way too many issues and not enough things for me to enjoy. I can definitely see the vision the developers had planned for the series, and it's quite telling that they either just didn't have the budget for the game, or perhaps had the wrong direction for how the game should play out. Hell, I'm surprised they were even able to complete the series with how this turned out. Unfortunately, I do have to throw this game into the trash category simply because of the cons, and it does suck that we had to start out this way. I'm just glad I don't have to fight those damn wolves again. But with that being said, let's move on to the second entry of this series, Legacy of Goku 2. Even though Legacy of Goku was a poor entry to the series, Webfoot Technologies was given a second chance because surprisingly enough, the first game was a huge success, sales wise. And with what I assume was a bigger budget, they came back swinging with the sequel. I mean, they had to. No way they released something bad and then continue to release bad Dragon Ball games. Plus this was the first game I played when I was younger so there might be a little bias. So let's start off with the gameplay. After a year since its first release, I think Webfoot wanted to make a statement. We can make a good Dragon Ball game. We can deliver on a better gaming experience. We can finally let you move in diagonal directions. This game has changed so much that you'd think that this was developed by an entirely different group of people. They took away the flying mechanic from the first game and replaced it with a sprint mechanic, which made the movement feel a whole lot better than having to collect orbs that won't last long. I did smack it to damn near every wall as I was trying to maneuver around the maps, but at least I can now run. You were also given a map to help guide you through different areas as well as a way for you to fly to different islands in an open area. I really like the ability to have an overview of the different areas you could visit because it really got me immersed into the game feeling like I was a part of the world, flying around like the Z fighters. You can also now save your progress at certain save points on the map as well as check out the game menu to look at your character status and use different healing items for your health and key. And that's only the surface of what's been included in the sequel because even the combat system got a revamp that made it a whole lot more playable. And that's not an understatement at all. Within this game, you can finally hit enemies constantly to lower their health while also being able to charge up your attacks for more damage and include more moves that were a lot more flashier than Legacy of Goku 1. On top of that, there were also temporary transformations available for the different characters you could now play as. Gohan, Vegeta, Goku, and Future Trunks were all of course able to go Super Saiyan, all while Piccolo could go, I guess, Super Namekian? Each having a unique moveset felt refreshing, and I always was ready to play the next character because of how fun and easy they all were to play as. And finally, they fixed the balancing issue between characters and enemies. They were challenging enough for me to actually feel like I was fighting a worthy opponent, but not nearly as hard to where I was dying 50 times to one stupid wolf fight. I could now fight back, and that went with the bosses as well. I really enjoyed fighting the bosses this time around because it felt a lot more fleshed out, and I was now able to see what Webfoot was trying to create from the beginning if they had the budget at that time. Even the story that was being retold had improved by a lot. In the first game, we experienced both the Saiyan and Frieza saga through the lens of Goku, which was not a bad idea. He is the main character of the series after all, and it's called Legacy of Goku. However, that did mean they were limited on what they could show us due to Goku barely being in action in the first place. He was usually the closing act and would save the day. Moving forward with Legacy of Goku 2, we were in the Cell Saga and with the characters we can now play as, we can experience the world of Dragon Ball from each of their perspectives. Starting the game off with the history of Trunks was an excellent way of introducing how much of a threat the androids were in the future timeline, and displayed how dire of a situation the Z Fighters would soon face in their timeline if they didn't prepare. Even though it was technically the Legacy of Goku, he was the one character I used the least because of how little you see him in the game. 
As you continue on in the story, I really did feel the urgency when it came to defeating the androids, especially with Cell later appearing in the game. I'm glad everyone got a little bit of a revamp on the designs, but when I saw Cell... Perfection. Wait a second. Even the little character profiles look a lot better than their older counterpart. I will admit, the Cell Saga was already my favorite saga from the series, but the developers definitely didn't disappoint with retelling the story, with of course a couple additions to help make things flow a little better for the game's sake. And that was with the help with some of the side missions. Now, with the side missions, they weren't as difficult to figure out what to do like the first game. For the ones that were woven into the main story, they were pretty straightforward and easy to do. Same as the side quests that could be found throughout the different areas. You would find people in need of help and they would be put into your journal to look at the different things you were tasked to do. Each side quest would usually reward you with a golden capsule, which was a collectible item that you could look for scattered all over the place. You could also look for missing Namekians so they could return back home to Namek, which you could actually tag along with, and there you would find a secret boss waiting for you. Cooler. Finally, you can collect trophies by leveling up your characters to level 50 and gain access to their caves. And let me tell you, the level grind was the most grueling part of this game. It took me so long just to level up each character to level 50 that I was slowly getting burnt out to be a perfectionist. But alas, I did it. And once I got each character statue, I unlocked the ultimate secret playable character. Hercule. It... It was Hercule. Was it worth it? No. I'm so glad the developers were given a second chance to prove to everyone that they can actually make a game intended for the fans to experience the world of Dragon Ball through the lens of their favorite Z fighters. With how much the gameplay has improved, to how well the story was told, all the way to making some pretty cool character sprites, there were a lot more pros than cons for sure as I was playing this game. And for that, I'd throw this game at the top of the tier list, making it an awesome Dragon Ball game to play. Having a budget for the sequel was definitely a humongous help and has ignited the faith I have in the series. Now it feels like Webfoot Technologies know how to close out the series with Legacy of Goku 3 with no issues at all. <clears throat> uh, what I meant to say was Boo's Fury. For the third installment of the series, Legacy of Goku received a different title but still shared the same elements as the previous two games. With how much the second game had improved from the first, I had confidence in Webfoot Technologies to conclude the story of Dragon Ball Z with a couple of tweaks and polishing to create the perfect action JRPG for the Game Boy Advance. And they almost did it! Almost. Gameplay wise, Boost Fury received a couple of add-ons to its game. First and foremost, through the leveling system, you can now earn attribute points and choose which stats you want to improve for your characters. You can also pick up items throughout the maps and equip them to also boost your attributes. Which can be a little overwhelming at times because there's always items being dropped constantly. Same with the healing items, where instead of using the items on the spot whenever you pick them up in the previous games, you can now save them and choose whenever you want to heal your health and key. The one thing I wasn't a big fan of with what they did with the gameplay was changing the open world map where you could fly around. This time, you could ascend and descend from location to location, but that wasn't the problem I had with it. It was the fact that the developers eliminated the markers on the maps, so now it became a lot more confusing on where I was supposed to be headed to. I don't think there was any reason why it should have been removed, and honestly, it just elongated the navigation from point A to point B. But I did like how on some occasions, you could find random encounters while flying around. Whether it's finding bad guys on a submarine or even on an aircraft. All in all, the stuff that Webfoot Technology did include to the gameplay didn't really change that much in the game and felt almost like an unnecessary inclusion just to make it feel more like a RPG. And that also includes the combat system as well. The one thing I will commend Webfoot Tech for including in the combat was that you can now block attacks that were thrown at you. To be honest, I rarely used the mechanic in the first place, but it's still an option there. The fighting mechanic remained the same with you being able to use the normal combinations given for each character along with the different special moves that can be used as well. You can also do fusion. I thought this was a pretty fun mechanic because you would be given a sequence of buttons to do the fusion dance. If you messed up, you'd wind up as one of the bad forms, but only as a joke. Once you properly fused, the game just became a whole lot easier, which isn't saying much because honestly, this game isn't difficult whatsoever. When it came to the level up system, the developers made it super easy to level up. Hell, you could even equip an item which granted you even more XP to speed up the process. I think it's nice that it didn't take such a long time to level up repeatedly, killing the same enemies over and over again. However, without the sense of a challenge, I found myself sometimes over leveling my characters just because of how simple it was. I found it interesting that even though we were given some pretty cool flashy skills brought into the game, they weren't as strong as using my basic physical attacks which did a ton more damage and were faster to pull off. There were a couple new enemy types included in this game where I didn't find much difficulty in but definitely impressed by the new varieties that were brought in. 
Sometimes it's good to let the past be the past. You've gone way too far back, buddy. Story-wise, I think at this point, the developers had a good understanding on how they wanted to end the series. Starting off with the Saiyan and Frieza saga in the first game to the Cell saga and Legacy of Goku 2, it was time to end things off with the Boo saga and Boo's Fury. Webfoot Technologies was able to fuse in some of the filler arcs from the anime into the story pretty seamlessly, which helped with the pacing of the game. Once again, since Goku isn't the only character the game is focused on, we're given the opportunity to experience the point of view from other characters. I enjoyed the moments of Gohan going to school for the first time and trying to live a normal life, as well as Vegeta interacting with his son Trunks. It was a bit of a slow beginning, but once the main threat of the game finally appeared, that's when the story picks up. Boo in this game was interesting to say the least. When playing as a fused character, I think that's when I had the most fun fighting against him, even if the battles didn't last long because I was OP as hell. They even managed to incorporate the Fusion Reborn storyline for us to fight against Janemba. I thought that was really awesome. In my opinion, I think Boo's Fury had the best soundtrack in the series, and that's mostly because each chapter felt so episodic, with the title playing and the music playing in the background. Witnessing a lot of the iconic moments in this game gave me a huge trip down memory lane, and I felt like a kid again experiencing so many of the cool moments that happened in the Boo saga. Majin Vegeta vs Majin Buu, Vegito vs Super Buu, and Goku vs Kid Buu to name a couple. The conclusion to the series was done nicely and I'm glad we got to see Goku and his friends many years later after defeating the final villain of the series. But of course, there's also the side missions which remain pretty much the same. A lot of collecting items, and I'll be honest. I didn't take the time to collect everything so I don't exactly know what the final reward was. However, there were also side missions which you were required to do in order to progress to the main story by collecting the Dragon Balls. And somehow, you had to fight Broly as a boss. They never really explained why or how we got there, he kinda just shows up. All in all, the side missions weren't all that important and the journal didn't really help keep track of what I was supposed to do. I feel like this game was a bit weird to me. It felt like, with some of the features added to make this feel more like an RPG, it resulted into making the game a lot more easier than it needed to be. It's nice that we were able to add points to our attributes, pick up items to wear, and now choose when to heal ourselves, but in result, I never felt pressured by enemies. The only thing I found difficult was honestly navigating through the open world map, and that's because they got rid of the markers. I enjoyed listening to the soundtrack as I was playing the story, and I'm glad it gave me a nostalgic feel like I was reenacting episodes from the anime. But if I were to rank this game, I'd say it was decent. It was an okay conclusion to the series, but it certainly didn't live up to the second game. I think if you were to play this game without ever playing the other two, however, I think you could definitely rank this up a little higher, but not a lot. I feel like these games perfectly represent the spots of where a Dragon Ball game would be placed if I ranked each series. I would love for every Dragon Ball game that's released to be amazing, but... That's only wishful thinking. Each game has its own merit, and even though Legacy of Goku 1 wasn't the best startup to the series, it paved the way for the other two games to be loved and remembered by so many. So I guess that just means don't give up on what you've created because you can always improve on whatever needs to be improved on. Have you guys played any of the Legacy of Goku series? If so, which game was your favorite? And who was your favorite character? If you've made it to the end of the video, then thanks for watching. Please consider liking the video, share with your friends, and of course, subscribe to the channel. Take care everyone, and I'll catch you in the next one.